Hi, I'm Eric, the Travel Guy, and this is a special edition of Beyond Your Backyard as we learn more about and enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday. My name is Eric Hastings. Yeah, that's me. And for as long as I can remember, I've always loved to travel, and I still do today. Airlines, hotels, cruises, new places, delicious food, I love all of it. And that's why I've been traveling the world professionally for more than a decade. But what troubles me these days is that Americans are leaving paid vacation time on the table each year at an alarming rate. Well, I want to help fix that. So please consider this a personal invitation to join me each week on my mission to get you traveling more than ever before. Because while the world is a pretty big place to explore, your next vacation is waiting to be discovered not just around the globe, but perhaps just around the corner. Let me introduce you to the places, people, and secrets I've discovered that remind me just how exciting it is to be alive and hopefully will inspire you to get out of the house and into your next great adventure. I am Eric the Travel Guy, and this is Beyond Your Backyard. Thank you for watching and welcome. You know, across this country, Americans will spend more than $1 billion on this one day holiday. Perhaps you will be gathering around with your family over Thanksgiving. Well, on this episode, we're gonna take you to Plymouth, Massachusetts to learn more about the origination of this unique American holiday. We'll also travel out to Farmington, Pennsylvania to a luxurious resort. It's Nemecolon Woodlands Resort to answer the age old question, to brine or not to brine, and we'll make two delicious side dishes. <laughs> of course, no Thanksgiving would be complete without Uncle Frank. Frank, Frank, good to see you, man. How you doing, Eric? Oh, good. I'm good. Thank you to come to dinner? Absolutely, I wouldn't miss this for all the tea in China. <laughs> okay. I don't know, does anybody say that anymore? How's your wife, is she good? Well, she had a touch of gallstones here oh, lately. Okay. They went in there and cut them suckers out, so she should be okay. She got to lay off the wine, though. <laughs> did uh, did your lawsuit wrap up? Did you get that wrapped up this year? I know that was big. Yes. Okay. Yes, it was fantastic. Okay. That garbage truck that ran over cost me three toes, but I got a hundred thousand dollar payout. I'd oh, sell them is, toes again tomorrow. This is all the. <laughs> As you know, Thanksgiving is a public U.S. holiday celebrated on the fourth Thursday in November. But I believe getting into the Thanksgiving spirit begins in late September, when the leaves begin to turn as a sheer sign winter is on its way. As far as I'm concerned, an extended leaf peeping weekend is the ideal backdrop for discussions on the menu selection for Thanksgiving while you sip pumpkin spice lattes or go apple or pumpkin picking. States in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, and Upper Midwest always seem to top the list for really seeing those gorgeous leaves. But as the weeks roll into October, we scare ourselves silly in haunted houses, overdo it with the children's Halloween candy, and before we know it, it's November. And soon, the annual Thanksgiving harvest and feast will be upon us. But where was the first Thanksgiving? Well, to get the answers, I traveled to Plymouth, Massachusetts. So I was thinking, you know, there's no better place to start our story than right here at Plymouth Plantation, a living history museum. After all, it was here that the pilgrims and the native people gathered for the very first harvest. I believe it's a fine and pleasant place you have. Did I get it right? Uh, it is a fair and pleasant. Fair and pleasant Indeed. place. Indeed. Why did you decide to take this journey? Well, in truth, Sarah, it was my husband, my first husband, William, his decision that we should come. Uh, it was his great hope that your uh, religion and prosperity might well jump together, mm -hmm. that we would be able to worship God in a better fashion and not worry about being uh, persecuted therefore. So do you remember the first day that you saw land, the first day that you were here? I was not feeling well. I was great with child when I arrived and I could not even see my toes. But we were anchored uh, on Mayflower about uh, three quarter of a mile out from shore, for it was a very shallow arbor. And I remember standing up on the deck and I saw the beach, uh, a, a white beach running as far as you could see down. And beyond that, it was trees. I had never seen so many trees in my life before. I mean, they are endless here. The, the country is wooded to the brink of the sea. And in truth, it gave me a great amount of fear. How many people on the Mayflower? There was about 100 of us. Mm -hmm. um, 
around about 20 families and a lot of children in that hundred, mm -hmm. uh, about 40 or so, but sailors as well. And tell me about that first winter. That was a, that was a tough first winter. It was terrible, Sarah. When we arrived here, it was already November. We meant to arrive in September, you understand, but were delayed. There was no one to greet us. Nowhere we could seek for succor, nowhere to give shelter to our weather-beaten bodies. We had to live shipboard the entire time. It took near unto a month to even find a place to build our town. And then after we found it, we yet had to live on the ship uh, as they built the town. I lived on the ship all through the winter. And that winter there was a common sickness come upon us. Not plague, I've seen plague. It was fevers and agues. Mm -hmm. Um, there were some days only one or two of us were well enough to tend everyone else who was ill. Um, my husband died that winter. Mm -hmm. William, what I told you of. Mm -hmm. um, Peregrine, my little one that was born shipboard when we were out at Cape Cod yet, was not even three months old at the time. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a great part of me that wanted to go back to England. But then I realised that God had preserved me through that winter and my sons for a reason. Would you mind showing me around your oh, home a yes, little bit? Oh, yes, certainly, this can wait. As Malka and I continued our discussion, the conversation turned to the first Thanksgiving menu, and she introduced me to her neighbor, a fellow educator whose area of expertise is agriculture and historically accurate culinary offerings. In other words, she's an expert on what was on the table in the 1600s. How much do we know about this first celebration in 1621, or what we would consider our first Thanksgiving. As a Soet, the King of the Indians came and brought several deer with him, which he gave to several of the chiefer men of the town. But he also brought a hundred of his men, and so they stayed for the better part of three days, um, in part to celebrate the harvest in, but as well to celebrate our joining together um, for that Massasoit has declared himself a subject to the King of England, and so we look out after each other here. What was on the menu? Did we eat turkey? I will tell you, sir, in this country, we eat turkey all year round, <laughs> for they fly by our doors, and my husband says, let's salute them with our guns and invite them into dinner. Mm -hmm. And so turkey is constant upon our table. But also in September, you see the first of the wild ducks here, the mallards and the widgeons and the teals, and also the geese, of which there are several kinds, even swans you might find here. And in September, there are still some fish to be had in the country, for the seas are not so rough that the boats cannot go out. So there's a great abundance to put on your table in September. And how long did it take to prepare this meal? Over the course of three days, you are constantly cooking. So you would start with the venison, for instance, that the roasted meats. Um, and then by the third day, it is the dregs of those things, the bones boiled up for broth. Um, so it is different food over the course of three days, but constant cooking, um, constant and continual. Many of the young men here are very good at roasting. Let's talk about the date, though. So days of Thanksgiving, should be for a particular reason, and therefore they are not annual events. So you have it once, you don't celebrate the anniversaries, and some of my neighbors are a little stiff-necked in their opinion of this. They think it is superstitious to continue to celebrate the anniversary of something. Really? But days of Thanksgiving for a good harvest are not uncommon, so if your harvest is good, you wish to celebrate, and therein you will have a day of Thanksgiving. What do we not know about this Thanksgiving that would surprise us to learn today from you? There was no pie. <laughs> uh, no pie? No kidding. And no apples. There are no apples in New England, sir. What about, what about pumpkins? There are pompions here, sir. And some of my neighbors now think you might use pompions as you would apples, now that we have been here for several years and miss these apples so very much. Yes. But no, no apples yet. Mm -hmm. What about the cranberries? Cranberries we do have here, sir, yes. Would they have been prepared much like today or no? They would be added to things, sir, uh, much like barberries are back in England, or green gooseberries, or even lemon juice that you would use as an accent and a sauce, uh, but not so much that you would use them by themselves. So when we look at our Thanksgiving table today, what from that table can we say, ah, this is a, this is a direct descendant of our first celebration? Uh, well, I, I think the turkey, sir. Um, and then if you take those 
things from your garden that you have available, then mm -hmm. that would be next. Um, and, um, but we should also include some venison and some fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we should have m several different kinds of meat on meat. the table. Mm -hmm. Well, this is perfect. Yeah, this, you is, are. this worked out. <laughs> Thank you for this. You're more than welcome. Very nice to meet you. Not surprising, the plight of the pilgrims is a story of hardship, but it's also a story of courage, diplomacy, survival, and determination. That story, along with one-of-a-kind artifacts, are depicted at the Pilgrim Museum, where I spent the afternoon learning more about this part of our nation's story. The year was 1620, and the Mayflower, that very famous ship, actually anchored about a mile offshore from this very famous boulder. This, of course, is Plymouth Rock. Well, okay, it looks a little small, but you gotta remember, this is not the original location of this rock. It's been moved several times, and the rock itself was about three times the size of the rock you'll see today. But it's still very photogenic. Whether you're in search of a cozy New England getaway or want to walk in the footsteps of some of America's first settlers, Plymouth, Massachusetts has something for everyone. Settled less than 40 miles south of Boston, this town of over 50,000 residents is full of rich history and classic charm. From historic churches, landmarks, and trails, to modern-day art galleries, restaurants, and shopping, Plymouth truly has something for everyone. From Massachusetts, I traveled to the southwest region of Pennsylvania and discovered the Laurel Highlands and the charming town of Farmington, where Nemecolin Woodlands Resort has been pampering guests since 1970. I was eager to get in the kitchen with executive chef Jeffrey Miller and learn how to make a few Thanksgiving classics. If I put a brined cooked turkey versus a non-brined cooked turkey, could you tell the difference? Absolutely. Really? Yes. Oh my gosh. All right, well, so what do we do? We're gonna start, that's where we're gonna start today? Yes, some people like to roast it whole. I like to uh, break it down so I can brine it. The brine gets more into the meat thoroughly. Really? We'll would truss it and then sear it in a rondo, and then we'll bake it off in the oven. First thing, just make your safety cuts right here at the thigh. Got it. Are we going to do the safety dance later on? <laughs> we could. And this is one of those uh, cracking, breaking oh. times. Oh. The thigh bone, just take it out. Oh. And then back here, on the back of the turkey, we have the oyster meat. A lot of people don't know about this, but this is definitely the best part of any turkey or chicken. Whenever I break it down, my um, salt to water ratio is one cup of salt to one gallon of water. Got it, okay. Um, and then about two hours in there broken down, but I would probably do it for closer to five or six hours if it was a hole. And then going down the center, there's a keel bone. Oh, yes. We're just gonna have to go on either side of that. And then all that you're doing is just cutting along side of the cage. Mm -hmm. And then down here, you'll find the wishbone. Yep. And you just wanna cut along side of that too. So you're finding that wishbone. Find the wishbone along. and it's your best friend. And then I always like to spin it around so it's on the same side. Easier to work with, mm -hmm. yep. And then for this part, I'll um, roast it off in an oven and then boil it for the gravy, for, for the stock. stock. Right here, you can kind of see a little line mm -hmm. that separates the thigh mm -hmm. and the leg. I kind of cut in between there. And then I'll normally throw the uh, legs in the stock as well. You can uh, cook them off and pull them apart for the gravy later on. From here, I'll just take the thigh bone out. There's only one bone in here. So just kind of cut, take your knife, cut alongside of it. And then we'll just throw them in our brine. Um, a cup of salt to a gallon of water. And uh, we'll just let that hang out for about two hours. Two hours, that's it. I, I like to brine it the day before, have it trussed. And then uh, the next day for Thanksgiving, that's whenever I'll sear it off, roast it in the oven. And now the trussing. And what is the purpose of the trussing? It just makes everything look a little bit more uniform and it cooks much more uh, evenly. Even. Just go underneath and then just tie them, just make a simple little knot. Whenever you go to roll it, whenever you go to put the tie underneath it, make sure you actually get both sides of meat. Got it. What's next? Next, we're going to uh, sear it off. Okay. on the stove, and then that'll help us get the crispy skin. I'm just using some uh, canola oil. You can use grapeseed. Stay away from the olive oil. And then you can tell your oil's ready to go whenever you start having that little bit of shimmer. And then I always like to go skin side down, and then this will ensure the best sear Got on it. the skin. You just kind of want to have a nice, a nice sear. 
10 minutes? Five to 10 minutes, I'd say, depending on how hot your pan is, how good your uh, range is at home. The cooking is going to take place in the oven. Definitely, I'm starting to get hungry. <laughs> you can smell it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Once we get that real nice golden brown sear on the outside, we just take them out of the oven. That's it, we're just gonna pop them in the oven. Then. Just pop them in the oven. You cover it? Um, I don't, because once you cover it, the steam, it'll get into the, back into the skin that we just crisped up. While Jeffrey and I tidied up our workstation and prepared to make two Thanksgiving side dishes, I had a thought about your Thanksgiving Day travel logistics. Thank you for calling Eric the Travel Guy Vacation Department. Please hold. And thank you for calling Eric the Travel Guy Vacation Department. Please hold. Oh, excuse me. Please hold. You know, as you know, the Thanksgiving holiday is one of the busiest travel holidays of the year, specifically the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and the Sunday after. So I say avoid the holiday stress and try to book your travel on Monday or Tuesday before and Monday or Tuesday after. See? One second. Yes. Oh, you'd like to speak to Eric? Oh, very good. Please hold. Shameless. I know. Mm-hmm. Oh, Cruz, excellent idea. Back in the kitchen, Jeffrey had one thing on his mind, Brussels sprouts and one of my favorite flavor enhancers. All right, what are we making? This is some bacon braised Brussels sprouts. Okay. Just gonna make little lardons. What'd you call me? <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> We're have name calling now. Come on. If I don't have this available, I can do thick cut bacon. Absolutely. And what do we do with these little guys? We're gonna throw them in a uh, pan. Start rendering pan. them out. Simplicity, temperature. Low to medium low. You want all that fat to come out because that's what we're gonna cook our Brussels sprouts in then. So we don't want the sugars to caramelize and uh, become bitter. I'm just gonna uh, cut the bottoms off. Okay. And then there's a couple little leaves around the outside that just are a little bit green and can have a little bit of bitterness to them. And then all that I do is just quarter them. Quarter them. Oh, nice. Perfect. So there's honestly two ingredients in this dish, bacon and Brussels sprouts, so. No onion, no garlic, mm -hmm. no, no, it doesn't need it. Doesn't need it. There's gonna be a little bit of butter at the end, but that's it. And then you can start to see a little bit of the fat bubbling out of the lardons. And then a little bit of brown color on the bottom of the pan. That's exactly what we want. How long? Low and slow, 10 minutes. And then once you really start to get that fat coming out of the lardons, you can uh, turn the heat up a little bit to a medium heat. What would you say the secret is to having the most successful Thanksgiving? I mean, you just have to have a game plan, you know how to do it, practice with the recipes. That way you know, oh, okay, I can cook a turkey in two hours or... Because again, this dish mm -hmm. can be made in advance. Absolutely. It can be made the day before, yeah. two days before mm -hmm. even. As much, and then it's into the oven. Yeah, into the oven, warm it up, and... It and isn't that one of the age-old problems of Thanksgiving, though? Yeah. Not enough oven space. Absolutely. So how do we deal with that? That's another issue we <laughs> run into. If I take that bird by itself and yeah. don't do anything to it, how long can that sit and rest? I wouldn't think about cutting it for 20 to 30 minutes. 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. because it's there's juices, there's so much heat in there. Um, cooking at a lower temperature, those juices won't run out nearly as fast, but you still want to give it plenty of time for everything to stay. Stay in. The order being, you pull the turkey out, mm -hmm. you put everything in yes. to warm, and you yeah. can make the gravy. Absolutely. And bring it all to the mm -hmm. table, and that's it. Slice it. Wow, look at these. Here, you gotta see this. Look at those. We got a lot of the fat rendered out. Everything's looking happy. We got plenty of uh, fat in there to cook our Brussels sprouts in, right. and then we got all of this stuff stuck to the bottom of the pan. That's gonna be the flavor for the Ooh, Brussels sprouts. That's mm -hmm. nice. uh, it's called fond. Oh, I'm gonna need a fork and a napkin. Oh, forget about the napkin, just the fork. <laughs> Are we gonna blanch these first or no? I like to have a little bit of texture and uh, with my Brussels sprouts, so I'll just throw them right into the pan. Oh my gosh, can just this like be that? any easier? A lot of people do like to blanch their Brussels sprouts, but whenever I do that, sear the char, the flavor doesn't really impart to the Brussels sprout that much later. But there's uh, you know, a bunch of salt that was in that bacon. That'll help break down the cell structure of the Brussels sprouts, mm -hmm. you know, allowing the you know, natural juices to come out. You want to keep it at a you know, medium, medium low heat. Uh, I normally throw in a little pat of butter. I do, uh, I do like to finish them a little bit with some apple cider vinegar, just a little bit. So simple. I love this guy. When you said a pat of butter, 
your idea of a pat of butter and my idea of a pat of butter is a little different. <laughs> a little different. I like yours better. Yeah. There's just this giant. What's the secret to good mashed potatoes? Uh, fat. <laughs> Got it. Perfect. And salt. Just the way I like it. Perfect. Jeffrey, am I supposed to be doing anything with these other than eating my popcorn? No, <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. That's, that's why we cook. Ah, oh, well, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Oh my gosh. We should try, can we try some? Yeah, let's right, do let's it. Do, try a little before we move on. Thank you. What else are we making today? Uh, we're gonna make some uh, green bean casserole. Oh. A I'm, take on a classic. A classic. Oh my God. That's amazing. No salt, <laughs> no pepper. Simple. Mm -hmm. Salt from the bacon. These Thanksgiving Day flavors and aromas really took me back to the traditions I experienced as a kid growing up. And one of those memories was a very famous parade I used to watch on TV every year. Did you know the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade was introduced all the way back in 1924? Each year, floats, marching bands, and other characters make their way down Central Park West to Herald Square in New York City in a celebration synonymous with the season. But the oldest Thanksgiving Day Parade is actually in Philadelphia. This tradition has been dazzling spectators since 1920. Back in the present day, it was back in the kitchen for the easy prep of my favorite Thanksgiving accompaniment. Jeffrey, I remember my mom growing up in the kitchen at Thanksgiving, she'd have to wear like a, a brace on her arm from all of the can opening that was going on mm -hmm. because everything came from a can. Yes. Here, that is not the case. No. And green bean casserole is easy to make if you do it correctly. It's very simple to make. Okay, well, what do we do? Where do we start? Well, we gotta start with some mushrooms. We got cremini mushrooms okay. and oyster mushrooms. These are the oysters? Those are the oysters. All that I like to do is I like to get rid of this stem. And since we, uh, since these are pretty big, I'll cut them in half and then start simply just cutting. And do the slice, okay? Yep, and just do a little slice. We're just gonna saute them in a little bit of oil and we're gonna make our own roux. And again, I'm using canola. We're gonna throw some butter in there. A little butter? You wanna be able to get a nice sear on the mushrooms. And then uh, once we get that nice sear, we'll put the salt in it. Then we add the salt, got it. Wow. But you're not using a whisk. Once it starts getting thicker, the whisk will just become a hindrance. Now look at the color on that thing. You see how it's starting to get like almost dry looking? Mm -hmm. That's how you can tell it's starting to uh, cook. The longer you cook a roux, the more aromatic it gets and more flavorful, the nuttiness. What is the point of deglazing? Um, deglazing, it just helps get a little, uh, a little bit of the stuff off the bottom of the pan and the wine. It'll help a little bit of acidity in the sauce later. I like to use uh, some heavy cream. It's a lot richer, a lot fattier. Mm -hmm. And then whenever you put them with the beans, they'll have, the beans will kind of leach out a little bit of their uh, own juice. Now once your uh, cream comes up to a boil, it's time to start adding your roux. And again, could all be done a day in advance. Absolutely. And I always just like to go a little bit at a time. Then you can see how thick it got. And then I'll uh, season with some salt and pepper because if you just go right now, put it in with your green beans, the roux didn't get a chance to cook out and it'll taste starchy. How long? So 10 minutes or so. Ten. Low heat, yeah, you just want it to bubble a little bit. And these green beans, I just blanched them off in boiling water. Opening up cans is great and it saves a lot of time, but you're building the flavors from scratch, you're adjusting consistency, you have you know control over the final product mm -hmm. on everything that you do from the beginning. Let's take it out of the oven. Look at those. And then here's our fried onions. Yep. So a small portion on the top. Very small portion. Say? Well, that's everyone's favorite part. Oh. Mm. Oh, ma'am. This is Thanksgiving. Made easy, fresh ingredients, mm -hmm. easy preparation. Take some time with it, right? Yes. Thank you, Chef. Yes, sir. Thank you. Awesome. You know, some of my fondest memories growing up are of mom and dad preparing an amazing feast and the entire family having so much fun. Hopefully this year, you and yours are making memories that will last a lifetime. From all of us at Beyond Your Backyard, thank you for watching and happy Thanksgiving. Who's ready to eat? Oh, yeah. Let's do this. Yes, let's do this. That turkey looks amazing. Oh my God.
Where's Uncle Frank? He never made it? Did he get arrested again? Oh, Frank, why? Have you ever made it with psychedelic mushrooms? <laughs> that'd, I be, that'd be a crazy Thanksgiving right there. <laughs> what? Is it time for me to do something? <laughs> well, it's ridiculous. I fit through this thing this morning. This is terrible. Okay. Okay, I'm ready for the cooking segment. Here we go. Waiting for <laughs> Turkey Architectural Digest to come by and do a photo spread here. Okay. Does it help that I'm wearing a corset right now? <laughs> I really want to stick my hands in there, but it would be very painful. That's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Jeffrey, how many of these green beans do you think I can stuff in my mouth? I'd probably start with a dozen. Oh, four, four, here. Four, 36. No. <laughs> Woo! A lot of work. Sounds like I'm at the chiropractor. This is ridiculous. <laughs>